welcome to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. And now, your host, Tim Johnson. The mission of the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry, LOBBY, is to foster a climate for economic growth by promoting the principles of the free enterprise system and representing the general interests of the business community through active involvement in political, legislative, judicial, and regulatory processes. Stephen Wagaspak, president of LOBBY, joins me when we return on the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. Louisiana Business and Industry Show will be back right after this. Founded in 1984, Bic Alliance and its subsidiaries connect business and industry buyers and suppliers with one another for the betterment of all. Bic helps companies grow in three ways. Aggressive sales and marketing campaigns in Bic Magazine. Finding the right people through Bic Recruiting and by merger and acquisition and related services through IBS Investment Banking. Contact Big Alliance today. The funny thing about Louisiana is that people don't often ask you why you moved home. They just accept it as the most natural thing in the world. Because of course I would want to move back home and be near my tribe, be in this beautiful landscape. It just inspires me. Whether it's a golden marshland, an expanse of sugarcane fields, a sunset through a cypress swamp. The outdoors here really are like nowhere else. You can start your day off paddling at Lake Martin, finish it off with music at the Blue Moon. I came home for my dream job, but also because I believe in Louisiana and where it's going. We're building a world-class central park in Louisiana, planned by the members of this community. And I just bought my dream home a sustainable house designed and built by the architecture students here at the university. My electricity bill was $30 last month. The life I thought I would have in Austin is actually happening right here in Louisiana. I'm E.B. Brooks. I have the job I want in the place I love. At Peak Performance Physical Therapy, we treat the athlete in everyone, from the soccer star to the soccer mom. If your doctor prescribes physical therapy, ask for Peak Performance by name, getting you back in the game of life. Consumers and property owners with a construction project can have a very successful result or a regretful experience that could have been avoided. Before beginning any construction project in Louisiana, verify licensure of the contractor and check references. Scammers may claim to be licensed or bonded, but you should ask for a copy of the license. For additional information, contact the Louisiana State Licensing Board for Contractors or go to the website lslbc.louisiana.gov. License and qualified contractors. It's the law. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show with Tim Johnson. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. I'm very pleased to be joined by my friend Stephen Wagaspak, who is president of the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. Welcome back, buddy. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. A lot going on, a lot to get to, so let's jump right into it. Give our viewers an overview of the current state of Louisiana's economy, the current state of the, the business environment in Louisiana. Well, and the short answer is doing very well. You know, I, I think you've heard a lot of the headlines and the, and the stats and all that, and you know, we lead the nation in export growth. We lead the nation in manufacturing growth. Um, about a hundred billion dollars in new projects announced, and so a lot of opportunity. When I go around the state talking to our members, it really doesn't matter what employer, what sector, how large or small. There's hope out there, you know, and so there's a lot of good news out there. And so, you know, our employers are fired up. They're looking for workforce. They're, you know, looking for to solving some of their issues when it comes to workforce and infrastructure and all that. But they're fired up and excited. Yeah, we're going to talk about workforce development mm -hmm. as we go through the show because I know it's critical to to everything that's going on in, at Lobby, and you guys are following it very closely. Now, you recently wrote a column, and I want to read this because I want to get it right. Your column was entitled Louisiana Crossroads, and you said this with apologies to Robert Frost. Louisiana once again finds itself at a fork in the road. One path diverts us from our course and deceptively appears on the onset to be flat and clear, tantalizing us with the allure of an easier route to a better place. The other is more complex and is steep and fraught with twists and turns. 
While the course is far more challenging, the final destination has the potential to be exceptional and is likely to be somewhere Louisiana has never been. What did you mean by that? Well, first of all, I'm glad someone's reading my column out yeah. there. Yeah, I know my mom does. I didn't know someone else does. So well, you know, there are two people that watch this show, and they're both my family members. So well, hello to them both. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but no, I, I feel like, you know, if you look at Louisiana, and, and this is Lobby's 40th year anniversary, and I think it's appropriate to look back on that, but also look back at the state for 40 years. And, you know, the 70s were a great run. 80s were pretty tough here. And for the next couple of decades, we kind of questioned ourselves and wondered what kind of state we could be. And, and did we have it in us to really compete with states like Texas and Florida and Georgia? And I feel like in 2005, when the storms hit, we had to rebuild, we had to rethink how we do things, and we had to recharge ourselves. And I think the state stepped up to the challenge. We took tough stands, we elected new leaders, we, we put new policies in place. People rolled up their sleeves and got to work. And I think that was a great, great sign that we were on the road to turning into a sustainable economy we deserve. Well now, all you hear about is the budget challenges. You hear about the, the tough decisions that have to be made. And I think we're at a crossroads. I think we can continue the course we've set since 2005. We can do the right thing. We can do, take, make the tough choices. Or we can take a shortcut and we can go and forget what got us here and jeopardize our private sector growth in order to answer some public sector challenges. And I think that'd be a huge mistake. You and I have, are, are in agreement, and you and I have had this conversation a number of times. but. You know, when you think about these budget challenges, it really is an issue of being able to set and properly fund real priorities. And I think that's one of the places where we've, we've struggled, quite frankly, for a long, long time in Louisiana. Uh, while we've done some really good things in terms of ethics, we've done some great things in terms of our business climate, regulatory, taxation, a lot of different areas. We still, I think, are plagued by these statutory and constitutional dedications that really hamper our ability to, to make budget adjustments mid-year or really fund priorities going forward. Give us your thoughts on those. What, what's the answer, Stephen, to these annual budget crises? No, you're right. It's, it's, the, it's the biggest challenge of our time right now. And I, I think it's important to remember a couple things. First of all, as we address it, we can't jeopardize the growth and the improvement we're seeing in the private sector. People are very cavalier with jeopardizing that. That should be our primary goal, mm -hmm. private sector growth. But as you look at the public sector, right now we've got about a $25 billion budget. It's about $9 billion higher than it was a decade ago. So if I told you a decade ago, we'd be roughly $9 billion higher in budget, you'd say that's pretty good growth over a decade. Really going from $16 billion to $25 is right. significant growth. Significant right? growth. And so that's something to be proud of, yet all we hear is, well, there's no money. The other side of that is there's a little over $11 billion that the state collects every year from taxes, credits, and fees from people like you and me. And so they have over $11 billion, yet we hear about $9.5 billion is what they have to spend. That delta is the deficit we hear about. And that's because our budget is filled with tripwire and traps and straight jackets and whatever other term you want to use for dollars we have that we really can't spend for what matters. And so, unfortunately, the only thing left unprotected, if you will, is higher ed and corrections. And when it comes to corrections, you really can't, you know, cut it too much because the Department of Justice comes knocking on your door if you do. That's right. And so higher is left unprotected. And so that's why this situation arises this year. It's not a lack of revenue. It's we don't have the revenue um, flexibility we need to spend it the right way. And the second thing is we have a tremendous amount of fixed cost in our budget that we refuse to address. And I'll give you one quick example. Pension cost. Over the last decade, our state pension costs have gone up 80%. Wow. And our teacher pension eight, cost. Eight, say that again. 80%. 80%. Eight, eight percent. Eight and, zero. Wait, I'm getting bigger. The teacher pension costs have gone up 124%. Wow. That's over $1.2 billion in our budget each year. So for every dollar I give higher ed, they're going to write a check for two-thirds of it right back to the state to pay for pension and overhead. That's unsustainable. We have got to take some of these fixed costs out of our budget. You can't tax your way out of a problem like that. So until we're willing to address our underlying cost issues in our budget, we're really wasting our time talking about the revenue side. Well, you think about those fixed costs, and you think about these dedications, and a lot of these dedications were done uh, to, to guard against political motivation and really to protect things that we thought at the time might be priorities, but they really are hindering our flexibility at this point. We've got about a minute left. Is it time for a, a rewrite of the Constitution? Is it time to go in and scrub these statutory dedications as well? What's the answer to giving us more flexibility? Well, you know, personally, constitutional conventions scare me a little bit, quite frankly, because once you start that process, you really don't know who's going to be drafting it, where it's going to go. You don't know what the outcome's going to be. I don't want to be that risky with our state's future. I would rather highlight the issues, have a surgical strike to go at them, 
and work with policymakers that are elected right now to figure out how to best to do it. To me, that's the most responsible way to go about it. You know, you have certain dollars that are locked up in our budget that are a fee for service. Over the years, industry or someone else has paid a fee in exchange for a certain service. That's a pretty direct way to mm -hmm. do it. You have other dollars in the budget that have just been gobbled up and locked up just for the heck of it, quite frankly. And I think those are some of the areas we should start along with addressing these underlying costs that are inflating at such a high level, we can't keep up with it. Well, it, it really is interesting to watch, and you know, I've watched it for the past 25 years of my professional career, and I know that if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. I think and we, Einstein had a quote about yeah, this. I yeah, I think so, and, I, and, and we, we really need to look at doing things differently. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. I want to jump into these proposed cuts to higher education that you mentioned. We're visiting with Stephen Wagaspak. He's the president of the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry, and you're watching the Louisiana Business and Industry Show on Cox 4. The Louisiana Business and Industry Show will be back right after this. Big Media Solutions is a marketing and communication, media advisory and event planning company within Big Alliance. Big Media Solutions offers custom book publishing, event planning, and keynote speaking to its clients in the business and industrial sector and marketing partnerships to others in publishing. Big Alliance is your business and industry connection. Contact Big Alliance today. What if I said that the American dream is alive and well, and that it exists for anyone willing to build it? That the power of a nation does not reside in its monuments, but in the hearts and minds of those who built them, and that the country's greatest heroes also wear hard hats? In today's America, it's not enough to dream about the future. You have to build it. Build your future at BYF.org. Consumers and property owners with a construction project can have a very successful result or a regretful experience that could have been avoided. Before beginning any construction project in Louisiana, verify licensure of the contractor and check references. Scammers may claim to be licensed or bonded, but you should ask for a copy of the license. For additional information, contact the Louisiana State Licensing Board for Contractors or go to the website lslbc.louisiana.gov. License and qualified contractors. It's the law. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show with Tim Johnson. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. We're visiting with Stephen Wagaspak, president of Lobby, and we, we talked about the budget issues in the first segment. We talked a little bit about the, uh, the economy and how well Louisiana is doing overall, but yet we still face these budget issues. Um, Higher education is critical. You mentioned it's one of the things that's left unprotected when we think about all the dedications that are in the budget. Um, if we, if we uh, believe what we read, there, there are cuts as high as $300 million to higher education that are being proposed, devastating levels of cuts. What are you hearing from legislators and what are you telling legislators? Yeah, I think when it comes to higher education, a couple of thoughts. First of all, last year to me was a tremendous um, uh, benefit for the way industry and higher ed work together. You know, the WISE Fund was created last year. It put some dollars in place that would help, you know, industry and higher ed work together to target workforce, you know, ready areas, uh, provided a match component, a lot of success stories there in the engineering space and other spaces. And I think everyone felt very excited about that. So coming into this year, that's the type of momentum we should be building off of as compared to throwing away, quite frankly. So we need to address programs like that. Um, the, the second piece when it comes to higher ed is, you know, we've accumulated a pretty good selection of leadership at, at the state level here. You know, outstanding, outstanding. leadership. Outstanding. And so the, the new leadership at LSU and the UL system and the LCTCS system and the Southern system and even the new Regents Commissioner, these are all top quality individuals. And I would say it's probably the, the best time in our state's history as far as leadership at higher ed. One of the challenges we face is, we ask these folks to come across the country and move here. We put them in place, and the first thing we tell them is, oh, by the way, we forgot to tell you something. You can't control your own tuition. You can't control your own procurement. You can't control your own insurance costs. You can't control what long-distance provider you, you use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We tie their hands. And so you have these innovators that you've recruited to come here, and you don't let them innovate. And so I think one of the nearest-term things we can do with higher ed is free them up from that garbage and let them go out and do their job. Do I think, what they do best. I think if you did that, 
you would see, you know, entities like LSU, Louisiana Tech, ULL really shine and compete with some of these other state peers. That would be the first thing I would do. The, the second thing I would do, again, is going back to the fixed costs we have in the budget. Right now, they're paying a tremendous amount in overhead on things like pension. We have got to get out of that business because you can't tax your way out of that problem. It um, really is difficult. Right? Well, a state like Michigan a couple of decades ago addressed this problem. They went to a 401k system. We refused to do so. It is a, is a, is a dinosaur system that we, is going to choke us all if we, don't, if we don't fix that. The proposed cuts to higher ed right now this early in the season, the good news is it's early, and we're going to go through the session. My guess is there will definitely be ways to uh, alleviate some of those cuts. I don't think that is realistic to put that on place. That $300 million would come out of a total budget of about $2.3 billion for higher ed. You know, a lot of times we talk about SGF, the general fund for higher ed. That's about $900 million, so that's huge out of that. They have other dollars on self-generated that goes into it. So $300 would come out of $2.3 billion for them. So I think that'll be alleviated in the session, and we'll be working with folks to do that. The other piece I would say is the reality is we have a very four-year heavy system compared to other states. We have a lot of four-year colleges compared to other states. And more so, than the state of Florida. I read more that just than the recently. State of Florida. I think maybe that was another one of your columns that I read. Man, you that are in. reading How these things. That? That's yeah. good to know. Yeah, that is correct. And so one of the challenges we face is the Board of Regions is tasked by Constitution to make sure that they approve programs that are working and they basically just take away programs that are not working. And if we've got schools that are carrying out programs that aren't meeting workforce to meet, not having high attainment rates, not having high graduation rates. Or duplicative, rates, right. We've got to eliminate some right. of those. We have got to look the taxpayers in the eye and say, look, we're not just going to throw money at a system that's not responsive to our needs. We're going to make it lean, mean, fighting machine but we're also going to make it one that can su succeed and compete with any other college in the country. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting, and I've had all four of those system presidents on the show, Sandra Woodley, King Alexander, Ron Mason, you know, uh, my friend Monty Sullivan, and they are working together and communicating with each other like never before. Totally and, agree. And, and if they, you know, as you say, had these restrictions lifted so that they could sit in a room and say, let's do what's best for the taxpayers, not be territorial and say, I only want to do what's best for my system, but what's best for the state as a whole, I think we'd get great innovation out of those guys. And as you say, we've got to, we've got to loose the restrictions and let them go to work. Agreed. Agreed. Let's talk about two other things that I know Lobby believe should be priorities in our state. Education, workforce development at all levels, and infrastructure. Let's start with education. Obviously, a lot of talk over the last 18 months or so about Common Core. I know Lobby has come out very strongly supporting Common Core and, the, and maintaining it in our system. Um, so let's start there. W what are your thoughts on Common Core, first of all? And I'd also like to know, as close as you worked with Governor Jindal, for, have you had conversations with him? And what does he say to you? Yeah, look, obviously he's a good friend, and we've talked about this issue over time, and it's just an issue we disagree with. And, you know, that happens sometimes between yeah. friends and, and everyone, and that's kind of where, where we are on this issue. Our view on Common Core is pretty simple. When I go around the state and talk to our members and ask them what their biggest challenge is, they always say workforce. And I ask them what that means, and the first thing they tell me is basic education. And quite frankly, we're 48th and 50th in reading and math. As a country, we're 17th and 26th in those categories. As the world gets more and more focused on the global economy and we're competing with other states and countries for jobs, we cannot compete going forward if we don't raise our game in education. There was a time in this state where a poor educational system was no big deal because a kid can just walk down the street and work in the plant down, down the road. Go get a job in the oil patch. Those right? jobs are more technical today. There are no low-level education blue-collar jobs left. Even blue-collar jobs require the ability to read and write and think. So we're not doing our kids any favors if we don't prepare them for the economy they're about to go into. That's why education, common core, autonomy, choice, all of those buzzwords you hear about, that's why they're so important because our decades-long failed education system, despite a lot of good effort, a lot of people worked hard on it, it's not producing the results we need, and going forward, we cannot tolerate it anymore. Yeah, and, and we're not blaming teachers. We're not no. blaming. We, we, we think if that the system can. If this was about hustle and effort, can, we right. would have an A plus. But it's not about that. We can we can raise standards. Kids will respond. We can compete against the rest of the United States and the rest of the world. It's critically important. We're going to take a break. Come back. I want to talk a little bit more about workforce development. I also want to talk about two other critical issues: infrastructure in our state, which leads directly to economic development, and I also want to talk about judicial reform. We're visiting with Stephen Wagaspak. He's the president of the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry, and you're watching the Louisiana Business and Industry Show on Cox Food. The Louisiana Business and Industry Show will be back right after this. 
Hi, I'm Joe Martin, president of ITI Technical College. Do you want a better life? Get your associate's degree in occupational studies in information technology from ITI. In two years, you'll be on your way to a better life. You will get hands-on specialized training in computers, hardware and software, networking, and more. ITI offers flexible class schedules, and financial aid is available to those who qualify. So don't wait. Call ITI now or go online. It's that simple. ITI for a better life. The funny thing about Louisiana is that people don't often ask you why you moved home. They just accept it as the most natural thing in the world. Because of course I would want to move back home and be near my tribe, be in this beautiful landscape. It just inspires me. Whether it's a golden marshland, an expanse of sugarcane fields, a sunset through a cypress swamp, the outdoors here really are like nowhere else. You can start your day off paddling at Lake Martin, finish it off with music at the Blue Moon. I came home for my dream job, but also because I believe in Louisiana and where it's going. We're building a world-class Central Park in Louisiana, planned by the members of this community. And I just bought my dream home, a sustainable house designed and built by the architecture students here at the university. My electricity bill was $30 last month. The life I thought I would have in Austin is actually happening right here in Louisiana. I'm E.B. Brooks. I have the job I want in the place I love. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show with Tim Johnson. Welcome back to the Louisiana Business and Industry Show. We're visiting with Stephen Wagesback, the president of Lobby. Infrastructure is critical, right? Leads directly to economic development. If you travel around the states, uh, you, you see like the state of Texas. Uh, you know, one plant manager told me one time, Stephen, when it comes to infrastructure, Texas does it 20 years before they need it. Louisiana is still studying it 20 years after they should have done it. What do we need to do to catch up on this $12 billion backlog and really develop the kind of infrastructure that our state needs uh, to, to, to match the economy and the growth that we're going to see? It's a critical issue, and unfortunately, it's all about money, money, money. Um, we've had a backlog issue for a long time now. We've been chipping away at it, but it's you know, too slow for anyone's likelihood. If you commute every day, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now we layer on top of it this manufacturing renaissance we're doing. We're creating billions of dollars in new jobs, and we're creating all these new products. You can only manuf manufacture a product if you can move it. Put it on the road, rail, barge. And you've got to get your, your employees in and out of your you facility. Get in and out. Right? So right. It's, it's being amplified right now. And so, you know, we need, we're going to be working this session with uh, some of the legislators, bringing some proposals to try to ramp up some of the spending um, in infrastructure. We've got vehicle sales taxes that have been dedicated to roads, but there's been a trigger that's preventing that. We're going to try to move, remove that trigger and start that phase in. We're going to do the same thing with some of the other dedications that need to go in there. We've got some spending that comes out of TTF right now, the Transportation Trust Fund. We need to move that out into the general fund, focus transportation trust fund on roads. Lastly, we're going to bring a proposal that's going to um, do something similar to what Texas did last year and basically use the, the top layer of our rainy day fund and try to use some of that for road projects whenever we have a full fund. That's a good way to use some of our existing savings account dollars. It's one-time dollars on one-time projects. Exactly. Makes that's sense, the right? responsible way to use those dollars. Right, right. So. Another critical issue that you guys are, have been dealing with for a couple of years, you were very heavily, personally heavily involved with this last year, is this whole idea of judicial reform, TARP reform in our state. Uh, what's Lobby's message this year on those? Well, this is an issue that I hear a lot from our members. And again, as we go around our state, they say it's a huge impediment to investment. We don't rate very well to other states. We've got the highest per capita number of attorneys and judges. We sue each other three times as much as Alabama. Got the highest jury trial threshold number. Very right? litigious society right. we've created. And so, quite frankly, this is a multi-year march. If you look at states like Texas who reformed their legal system, it took them about a decade to do it. So this issue is not going away, and every year we'll have to take a sensible approach. Um, this year what we'll do is we're trying to bring some proposals that will bring some transparency in the system. Um, right now, if you're in the legislative branch or the executive branch, your financial disclosure goes online if you're an elected official. In the judiciary branch, it doesn't go online. We think taxpayers deserve to see that. Sure. We're going to ask the judiciary to do that through, through legislation. Second, if you look at budgets, an executive branch agency, there's a website called The Track. All of their budgets are online. You know how they're getting their money and how they're spending it. In the judiciary at the district court level, you don't see those dollars. We don't know where those fees go. We don't know how they're being spent, who's being contracted with. We're going to ask them to put that online, just like executive branch agencies. Again, we don't view this as unfair. We view this as parity amongst the branches. 
and we'll bring bills this session to do that. It's about transparency. So we'll be watching for those things. We've got about two and a half minutes left, so I want to hit on a couple of topics. The first is, because of the state's budget issues, we hear a lot of discussion about business incentives being curtailed or in some cases eliminated. Attracting investment in our state's a globally competitive exercise, right? How critical are these incentives and maintaining these incentives to keeping us competitive? Well, I think what, what I hear from our members is what they want is a fair and competitive tax code. That's what we'd like to have. The reality is that's not what we have right now. We have a, you know, a very cumbersome tax code. And so the exemptions and credits over the years have been laid over it like a piece of carpet, quite frankly. And so we can rip the carpet out all we want and throw it away, but what's going to be left is a cracked foundation. Right. And so if we're ready to fix our tax code, let's have that conversation. Let's do it right so we can compete with other states. If we're not going to go there, we should be very careful about ripping up the carpet until we're ready to fix the foundation. And right. that's our message on that. Because all of these great jobs coming here, they could just as easily have gone somewhere else. They came here because we were able to put together a plan to incent them to come here. That's the important piece of this uh, renaissance that's going on right now. It's going to be critical that we watch that going forward. Uh, let's talk about engagement of the business community. To tell our viewers how critically important you believe it is that business leaders, both large businesses and small businesses, get engaged in this legislative process and work with you guys and, and provide support? I think it's critical. I mean, if you go to any community around the state, um, no matter what the challenge is, whether the local school needs new band uniforms or the local charity needs an investment or some, or some uh, elbow grease, usually it's the business leaders who step up in those areas. And they do it time and time again, and, and they've kind of built their brand name on it. It's no different at the state level. You know, a lot of times in the state capitol, you know, we forget to include that voice in the capitol. And it's important for legislators to hear from their businesses, and we're a good, you know, conduit to do that. Because these are the job creators. These are the people hiring and firing in their districts. These are their investors. If our economies are going to grow locally, which helps school board budgets, which helps infrastructure, we need that business voice to tell legislators what they need to expand and grow. And, and that's why their voice is so important. Well, this is going to be, as we all know, another very critical year in terms of the legislature in our state. We're facing huge budget deficits. We'll be dealing with that. You guys will be watching it closely, and I know that you will continue to do the fine job that Lobby has done for years and years and years. Stephen Waxback, thanks, thanks for Tim. joining us. Appreciate today, it, man. man. We'll be watching. Now that's a wrap, guys. Thanks for being with us. Join us again next week at this very same time for another edition of the Louisiana Business and Industry Show on Cox Food.